Hallo Silke. Hallo Micha. I'm so glad that we finally get together to have this chat. I know you are very, very busy, so all the more thank you for taking some time and that we can sit down and talk. Looking forward to that. Um, maybe for those who don't know you, uh, let's start with a very short introduction of who you are. And if, you, if I would like to ask you, um, please tell a little bit about yourself. I'm happy that you ask who I am and not what my CV is. <laughs> <laughs> it makes things easier. So um, I'm a mother. Um, I'm COO of uh, BSH. Um, I'm German, but I have a migration background. I was originally born in Transylvania. I'm kind of an engineer, a mechanical one, but um, above all, I love being a leader. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> yeah, basically that's me. That's you, yeah. Uh, but you were not born like that, I guess. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I think um, we leave out a lot of details and maybe we don't need to go into that. And I think uh, you already mentioned one or two points that uh, I would like to talk to you about. Uh, you mentioned the term leadership. Um, I don't want to ask the usual questions like uh, how to combine being a mother with being a leader, things like that. Basically the same thing. The same thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I would, I would agree to that. Um, no, I would like to more understand when you grow up somewhere, uh, you have a family, but at one point you feel that I'm not just a mechanical engineer. I think I'm born to do more. I, I, I like to do more. I like to be a leader. Mm -hmm. um, when did that start and how did that start? Um, well, I wouldn't say that it start, started out, out of such a feeling, a big one. Um, I think it somehow started when, when I was at university and I had all these brilliant engineers around me doing crazy stuff and, and knowing all the um, equations and everything and I was kind of, I started mechanical engineering because I thought it's very versatile, you can do everything with it basically. Mm -hmm. And during university I always did the joke, um, actually I don't have a clue about technology so the only thing that I be can become <laughs> is actually a manager. A manager. And somehow it worked out. Mm -hmm. And was that really a plan from there, from that university time that you said, one day when I'm at that age or that many years into my career, I will be at that position? Was it a really goal fixed? Or? No, definitely not. Definitely not. Um, I always took my decisions uh, when they came up. Mm -hmm. You have to cross the bridge when, in, when you come to it. So I never planned for anything. It's, it yeah. just happened somehow. You know, that's interesting that you say that, and I'm not really sure I believe that completely. Because in all these books uh, about self-realization, mm -hmm. it starts with you have to have a goal. You, mm -hmm. know? you have to really work towards a goal and exercise some discipline, things like this. It's not coming without something that's driving you deep inside where you say, I, this is maybe not the conscious goal, but it's something that is really deeply rooted in you. There is definitely a goal, but it doesn't have to do anything with, with the typical career thoughts. Um, and this goal, or it's, it's basically a, a value, and mm -hmm. this value is growth. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be part of growth, if you want to foster growth, if you want to help things and people to grow, um, it's better that you're in a leadership position. Mm -hmm. So I guess that was somehow the, the connection. And um, you already mentioned the next good link, uh, growth is not just stuff, it's not just the EBIT of a company, growth is also strongly related to people. Definitely. And I remember one of the first conversations that, that we had, um, you made me aware of your principle 4M, yeah? <laughs> man muss Menschen mögen, one has yes. to like people. Um, how important is that for you and how important is that in contributing to growth? I think you cannot lead people if you actually don't like people. That's for me um, a basic thing and I think benevolence in, in German Goethe mm -hmm. um, is really important because it means to me that you look at people from the positive side. You start with the good side. You start with the assumption that people are good and mm -hmm. want good. Um, it may sound naive but I think that's, that's very valid. And I think if you believe in people, they actually feel they're in an environment where they're able to grow. Mm -hmm. 
So to me, it's it's really um, a mandatory precondition, and I never understood how people can get into leadership position. And you have the feeling that basically they would love to be somewhere alone on an island and not talk to <laughs> not anybody. Not talk to anybody. Um, when when you mentioned that about uh, liking people as a as a core mandatory mm. requirement. In my head, uh, an image popped up that reminds me of school. Uh, when you say, when you ask teachers, do you have any preferred kid, or mm -hmm. how is that? No, no, no. I like all kids the same, and you know it's not true. Uh, and and but what they can say, and I'm pretty sure this is also true in real work life. Yeah, you of don't course. like all people alike, and there's also people where you really don't feel any kind of sympathy. So. Mm -hmm. um, Uh, can you a little bit elaborate uh, on that when you say, I, I really like to see people and I really like to see the positive side of things. Mm -hmm. um, what do you do when you meet somebody where you say, I don't find any kind of connection. I, I really don't know if I even like that person. So you force yourself? How, how, how does that work? Um, of course, you don't like everybody like you like a friend or you don't mm -hmm. you don't have a connection to everybody but uh, one thing one principle that helped me a lot was always um, I believe you can learn something from everybody mm -hmm. so everybody even if you don't especially like the person and, and you wouldn't like to spend time mm -hmm. um, in your free time with that person you still can learn and there is nobody who has nothing that I have not Mm -hmm. um, and at least you can learn how not to do things. So yeah. um, I, I really appreciate, if not the person, then the lessons that I can learn from them. So I discovered a second value that is driving you, uh, and it's curiosity uh, as well. Yes, yes. But uh, I'm more curious about people than about things, I have to admit. And that's very interesting because at, at least maybe um, even a lot of people would not think that being curious about people brings you in a leadership position. Maybe usually people would associate being a leader is I like this company, I like this product, I work hard for the it and, and not for the we in terms of uh, authentic leadership speech. I don't think it's a question of um, either or. Mm -hmm. you, you need to be interested in, in all the things. But I think in order to create and move things, you need to move people. Mm -hmm. And in order to move people, you need to understand them. You have to be interested in them. And I think people also feel it in daily conversations, whether you're really interested or you're not. Oh, you're not. Yeah. And to understand people, to understand their needs, their values, their fears, um, means that you're able to influence what they're doing. Mm. And I don't mean manipulating, I mean influencing. Let's talk about fears for a moment. Yeah? Um, when you ask what's, what's driving people, um, there's always this kind of positive energies where mm -hmm. you say, this is what I want to achieve. But there's also some kind of, if you like, negative uh, mm -hmm. energies. This is what I want to stay away from. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm good. I'm outperforming because I'm afraid to be fired, for yeah. example, a classical scheme. Uh, I think you introduced a term into your current company, the ERC, yeah, the Emotional Root Cause. Mm -hmm. um, how important is that as a leader to understand emotional root causes? How much is this emotional aspect important for the organization as a whole? Because usually you break it down to processes, to rules and tools, and then ah, yeah, we also have some the, the people aspect. but. How deep yeah, is okay. that emotional aspect really in the, um, how important is it? I think it's, it's a source of everything, basically. I don't know whether you like, whether you know the movie Monster Inc. Mm -hmm, um, everybody who has kids knows it. may know it. And um, I think there's a very interesting principle in that. Um, for those who don't know it, um, it starts with monsters are collecting their energy they need for their life by the fear of kids. Mm -hmm. They come out of the wardrobe, they scare the kids during the night and they take that energy. And the basic finding in the end is that actually the energy of a laughing kid is much bigger than the one of a of a kid that is afraid. Mm -hmm. And I think that applies to everybody, not only to kids. Mm. And um, I think the energy that is in an organization depends on 
the emotional level that um, a company has. And of course, there can be a very high emotional level also as regards fear. Yeah. But I think it's it's more important to create a positive one. Well done. Uh, there's there's uh, another connection that you just created. You said uh, you, you made a link basically between what's happening in uh, with kids, and mm -hmm. that means a private life and a work life. I sometimes get the impression there is a almost artificial distinction in how you should behave in your work environment yes. as opposed to how you should behave at home. And I find myself, a lot of things are almost identical. How, how is that for you? For me, it was always a very, very funny moment to see my colleagues in their work life and then to meet them in their private life. And with some people, it, it seems like Jekyll and Hyde. Mm -hmm. And um, I never understood how you can split your personality in that way. Of course, I, I wouldn't fire my whole, <laughs> all facets of my personality to, to, yeah. to my uh, employees or to my colleagues, because that may be too much. But I'm the same person, maybe different, looked at from mm -hmm. a little bit different angle, but I'm always the same person. And of course, whatever I experience in my private life and whatever values I have in my private life, they will show up in one or the other form also in my work life. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, it's basically it's stupid to neglect that. And would you say that extends even to how you lead? I mean, when you say how I lead people in my work life, is that similar or the same as to how you lead the people in your private life? Um, I would say in my, in my private life, I, I don't have that leadership position that much. So, of course, I behave maybe some, sometimes differently. Also, my, my partner, he always says he's scared of me <laughs> since I told the cat to sit. Um, yeah, um, she does. Um, but I, I think I'm the same person. Some mm -hmm. mechanisms are the same, but I have a different role at home mm -hmm. or at work. So that changes things a little yeah. bit. However, there's one thing in common, uh, I think, for both. And let's talk a little bit about that. What, everything you told so far sounds like it's almost like fairly easy. You have to read people and you have to like people. Mm -hmm. You have to bring in a certain set of qualifications, obviously yeah. a certain level of curiosity. And then it's Things a no-brainer. Work it, it just works out, yeah. yeah? Uh, and, then it's, and then there's real life mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't. And um, so what I want to talk about are a little bit those moments that are um, not the easy part. So mm -hmm. for sure, especially when you are a leader and in, a, um, in an environment that's challenging, um, there's a lot of stress in the end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of, many different people want many different things. You are bound by a lot of boundary conditions and um, I suppose you're not different than many other people that you say, actually what I would like to do today is this, but actually what I'm doing is that and that is driven by certain boundary conditions and that imposes in the end a certain conflict because you, you can't, you're not really free to do what you want mm -hmm. because you depend on other people, mm -hmm. they don't tick as you would like them to tick sometimes, they, something comes up unexpectedly from somewhere and you have to just deal with this. So to make it short, there's a certain stress level that's permanently bombarding you and I think that's also normal in, in mm -hmm. private life. Uh, you can have things unexpectedly working on you. Um, my question now is, how, how do you deal with that? How, how, how does it work for you that you say, I'm, I'm not going close to burnout, I'm still... <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're not. <laughs> um, no, no, right now I'm fine, right now I'm fine. Um, I think with stress, it's a little bit like, like with, with training your muscles. If you do mm -hmm. a lot of exercise, you have to have moments where you pause, where you rest. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you don't build up strength. Mm -hmm. You just um, build up fatigue. And I think that also applies to, to the life, no matter um, whether it's the personal or the business life. Um, to me, obviously, the combination of both uh, is the most stressful one. Um, but I think Maybe my secret is to have those moments where I can really let go. For example, mm -hmm. when I go on a holiday, um, I hope my colleagues don't watch this video, but anyhow, <laughs> um, 
Actually, I, I look at the phone once a day mm. and not more often because I know those, uh, for example, my, my PA, she has my, my private um, mobile number, so she can text me whenever there is something really urgent. But otherwise, I really switch things off mm. and um, this also helps me switching my head off. That's something that I was always able to do and that helps a lot because it gives me the rest that I need. Yeah. Um, and I think also that stress is something very individual. Mm -hmm. I had to learn that um, and actually I think I have quite a high level of resilience mm -hmm. due to this fact that I can switch off yeah. um, but also due to the fact that I have emotional breakdowns every now and then. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I really believe that for example especially for a lot of male colleagues this you don't have you're not allowed to have emotions you're not mm -hmm. allowed to cry. Um, that somehow creates like um, like an unhealthy fouling atmosphere somewhere inside you and that's what from my point of view leads you to burnout and I'm the type of person if I really have stressful times there will be one night where I lie in bed where I start crying and yeah. where I'm just so sorry for myself for a night and then I'll find again and I think that's really important to deal with those emotions, not yeah. to neglect them. Yeah. Um, isn't that unfair? Um, I, I, and you mentioned a lot of things mm -hmm. I want to go deeper in, but, but right now, isn't that unfair? Because uh, when you say I can live or create my balance by even mm -hmm. showing some emotions, mm -hmm. such as uh, I'm crying sometimes, mm -hmm. um, and, and you think about the, I guess you know vulnerability, Ted. Yeah, the TED talk about vulnerability mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. and, and the follow-up speech, I don't bear with me, I mm -hmm. don't know what, mm -hmm. how it's called, but it's about also roles and expectations. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that's binding males mm -hmm. is you're not allowed to show. Yeah. You're, you're measured by results, yeah. uh, you're not allowed to show emotions, you're for, uh, it's still yeah. quite strong role models. So would you say that puts you in an advantage? That because when you show emotion, it creates even maybe a positive reaction, but if Ah, a male counterpart would, would show <coughs> emotions like this and would be like, he's weak. No, actually it doesn't. Um, it's, it's more like, oh, it confirms how we always assume that women are so emotional and um, not uh, fact-oriented and so on. Mm -hmm. But as people think that of you anyhow, you can as well <laughs> adhere to that cliché. Um, I, I don't think it's an, it's an advantage in work life because it's also turned against you, mm -hmm. but it's an advantage for coping with stress. That's mm -hmm. definitely an advantage. Um, I really envy people who are always very, very controlled and can be very down to the facts in emotional situations in work. I'd, I'd rather not be emotional in such situations. But on the other hand, maybe that's the same mechanism that peeps, keeps people from dealing with emotions also when they're not mm -hmm. at the meeting room table. And so I'd rather take my emotional part and have it everywhere if I cannot keep it out of the meeting room uh, than not, not having mm -hmm. it because I'm quite aware that it saves me from burnout or too much stress or taking the stress to my family, which I sometimes do, sorry. Mm -hmm. so let's bridge back or make the bridge back to the resilience. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Um, so how is that from your point of view? Is building up resilience a consequence of um, showing your emotions because it creates, makes you stronger since you have a, uh, how did you say that before? It's not starting to foul or somewhere inside. inside yeah. yeah. Or is resilience something like a necessary ingredient to become a leader, I have to protect myself, so I have to somehow foster the resilience in me. It's not only important for leaders. Um, if, uh, for example, my, my two neighbors, they have three kids and four kids, and I really uh, envy their resilience because that also takes you to the edge. Mm -hmm. I think resilience is necessary for everybody. Mm -hmm. To me, it just means you can cope with whatever life throws on you without having a real damage inside you. Mm -hmm. Which doesn't mean that you feel bad, you feel sad, you feel angry, but it helps you that, that it doesn't somehow eat you up from the inside. 
So it helps if you have resilience, if you're a leader, mm -hmm. because otherwise, uh, sometimes I'm just sitting there and I'm, oh my God, what responsibility do I have? And then I'm like, <gasps> and then I think, oh no, just go ahead. Mm -hmm. And does resilience, is that something that you um, create consciously? You Previously you said uh, you're ability to withstand stress is mm. like flexing a muscle yeah if you yeah. exercise that then It this grows. ability becomes mm -hmm. uh, bigger would you say the same about resilience or would you rather say it's a naturally genetically defined level and you have it or you don't well that's a very philosophical as well as scientific discussion i think um, and I, i don't claim to have any any deeper insight i just can can say how i feel it for myself mm -hmm. um, I think there, there was quite a bit of resilience already through childhood and, and so on created. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think of course you, you grow with certain, certain characters, um, but I think it, it's built up through life. Mm -hmm. And um, the question how you, how you deal with the things that life throws on you, um, it's training your resilience from my yeah. point of view. And it helps a lot to be a little bit self-reflective and to understand your own mechanisms, your your red spots, as I call it, where, where people, your red buttons button. where people can push it. Yeah. Um, you have to work on those to understand yourself better. And, it, and I think that's, that's really building up um, resilience. Mm -hmm. And you have to focus on the things that are really important. Such as? For example, when I got my daughter, um, my resilience for work issues increased <laughs> like 10 times mm -hmm. because you understand what is really important to you in life. Yeah, yeah. I think there are many studies that mm -hmm. actually show that um, when people are successful or when you look back at people who are successful mm -hmm. that way around, um, some of them really went through hard times. Mm -hmm. So you, you may, and, and there are studies that kind of support the, the idea that resilience is something that your whole environment mm -hmm. from the, when you are a child basically starts being built up. And I remember one example of, I think that were even, uh, Uh, identical twins mm -hmm. uh, from a slum somewhere in South Africa, uh, South America, and one became an Olympic, mm -hmm. and the other one just stayed there and yeah. became a small, yeah. um, a small uh, a gangster or a crook. Mm -hmm. And and the, what they found in the end of the day, one of the the, the successful person mm -hmm. was the one who, uh, if you divide the world into the problem solvers and, mm -hmm. and the one who just you know everything is a problem a fine problem uh, that was the guy who said well, i just mm -hmm. i just solved that um you're nodding so i think you know what i'm talking about let's go back in time mm -hmm. um would you describe yourself you've always been like that that you always found whenever you had a challenge like in university when you said you know mm -hmm. all these guys know all these equations or even back further mm -hmm. uh, when you were playing and maybe there were bigger kids in the neighborhood that wanted to take away your toys. Uh, is that something where you say this, this was always a, a strong part of me or was it rather something that no. you found it's <coughs> actually, actually started developing? Um, I, I think it, it's somehow built up through life because actually I was uh, quite, a, quite a timid kid and mm -hmm. more on, on the ones being bullied than on the ones on the side bullying. Um, but um, I think that, that life is shaping you. For example, as regards the kid, I, I always had uh, really good friends. I was good at school, like in, in primary school. And so I had a really nice social life, but people always picked me for bullying because I was the smallest. I, I had good votes in school. Um, and I always started crying when I was angry. So people took, took that as a weakness. And for example, we had this one bully at school class. He was like one head higher mm -hmm. than me and, and much stronger. And he really bullied me for one and a half years. And then the moment came where I was so fed up because he was interrupting in, um, us in, in playing and he pushed me and somehow, and I just turned around and I hit him in the solar plexus so strongly that he fell. He started crying, he ran to the teacher, he complained about me. Yeah. And the teacher, she was also punishing um, me, but she was smiling, she was like, And that guy obviously was destroyed because the smallest in the mm -hmm. class hit him Managed and he to... fell and he cried. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, that's the way how you build up resilience. You, you take 
input from mm -hmm. the outside and you change the way that you're reacting on that eventually. And this shaping your reaction, that's what for me creates resilience. And then the next time you're in that situation, you don't wait two years to hit that guy. To hit back. Uh, uh, so guys, I should maybe don't, don't take get a physical. <laughs> don't get physical on those things. I never, I, I never hit people nowadays. You have different methods. <coughs> I have different methods. <laughs> um, actually, in preparation of that interview, I started mm. reading also a little bit about that term resilience, and we now have the next buzzword like uh, resilient leadership mm -hmm. and, and how important this. Uh, new asset is uh, for leadership. Really, I was asking myself when I was, was reading this, and uh, is, that, is, that, is that true? Or is it more like it's simply a necessity? Um, take the example what you gave about the smartphones mm. or the telephones. You said um, uh, one of the things I do to, to, to create my life balance is mm. when I'm on vacation, I shut off my phone and I just check it once mm -hmm. a day. Um, a couple of years back, there was there were no cell phones, mm -hmm. so there nice was nothing time. to check. Yeah. You simply had that life yes. balance. So yeah. where I'm aiming at is obviously that, um, do you think that today you need a higher level of resilience than, a, than let's say 10 years ago or 15 years ago because the amount of um, stress that is mm -hmm. in the, ultimately around you um, and smartphone is obviously just mm -hmm. one of them. Uh, business challenges are another yeah. one. Um, uh, I don't even want to go too far to say VUCA world or mm -hmm. whatever, but do you think that that grew over time or was always the same? I think it changed over time and uh, it didn't necessarily grow because when I, when I look at the time of my grandparents, there have been wars, there have been the question how to survive the next day. That's real stress from my point of view. Um, to deal with 300 emails a day, um, it's a question more of find your way and, and take your discipline. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody is forcing us to look at yeah. 10 times an hour on, on, on the smartphone. We're doing it. What you have to create now is a certain ability to filter. Mm -hmm. and as it is a new challenge because all that um, connectiveness and, and communication is new, you have to find a way to deal with this new situation. I'm not really good dealing with that because I'm looking way too often on my phone, for yeah. example, um, but it's not really stressing me. I, I want to challenge that, isn't mm -hmm. that? And the challenge I want to, to give is um, one could also argue, let's look at the uh, one example of uh, temperature of mm -hmm. ovens. Mm -hmm. yeah? I, I know in the past, uh, my grandmother simply said, don't touch it, it's hot. Mm -hmm. And of course you touch, and of mm -hmm. course it was very hot. <laughs> yeah? uh, apart from that learning curve, mm -hmm. today uh, the appliances that are being built at, mm -hmm. at BSH, for example, uh, take care that you don't burn yourself. You can touch the glass. Mm -hmm. yeah? Like uh, The standards are yeah. more and more demanding this, mm -hmm. obviously, as well. Um, and I'm sometimes thinking, isn't that also going in a way of overprotecting? Uh, uh, isn't that a little bit like now we have to build up resilience because we are all this overprotected sissies uh, from a generational <laughs> standpoint of view? Uh, and yeah. now it's the next buzzword. a little bit, yes. Yeah. Um, maybe a little bit um, in, in certain things. You have to protect yourself today from, from a more complicated world. <laughs> Some things are easier, like um, fail-safe uh, ovens. Um, some things are more difficult. Um, hello, cat. <laughs> Let's see if she likes me. Mm. <laughs> oh, she likes food. Um, where was I? Ah, the question of... Hmm, she doesn't like the question. The question <laughs> of um, whether it's become more difficult. I think we're exposed to a different kind of stress now. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more the stress of having too many things than of having too few things. It's the stress of having too many visual informations or informations than the stress of not having enough information. So it, it, changes, it changes. It changes from dealing with one clear problem to dealing with a thousand small ones. Taken. Uh would you agree that there's also a second uh, aspect that you, you always, I, I remember that you, you tend to say it's um, 
the, the relationship between a leader and its team, uh, the, that door always goes in both directions. The mm -hmm. team has a certain expectation the yes. leader should fulfill, but the question is also, and what are, what's your contribution? What mm -hmm. are you doing for yeah. that? So it's not just a one-way um, door. And do you think that over time, or did you observe that over time there is a bigger tendency Uh, to go away from, uh, like in that famous picture, don't ask what the country can mm. do for you. Yeah, don't mm. ask what the company mm. can do for you. Yeah. Ask what you can do for the company. That that was more intrinsic, maybe a generation ago mm. or decades ago than today. That today there is more um, the expectations uh, side uh, and not the I need to to give uh, and and to contribute side as well. I think it's a it's a mixture. Um, I think it really depends on the company's culture mm -hmm. nowadays and also 20 years ago. Um, and it strongly depends on the individual. And I believe that the corporate situation and energy you have influences that more than maybe the generation you're in. For example, if a company, a company is in the complacency zone, then this, uh, what can I have from it, uh, grows. If you're more in a challenging situation with strong competition, with, with this, um, a challenging environment, then people also change inside the company. If they don't change, the company doesn't have a future from my point of view. Um, that brings me to some final question. Um, when I understand you correctly, what you're saying is that the corporate or the company culture, the work environment mm -hmm. where you're living um, is shaping you. Yes, and uh, of course you can are contributing and shaping that as well. But you feel that aspect quite strong and even stronger, or at least the same strength than what the non-work environment, the society impact is in terms of culture. Because um, often you would assume it's an outside culture mm -hmm. that just happens to work uh, in a company together. So if you want to change the corporate culture or the company culture, actually your task would be look more outside. Yeah? Uh, you have to change the culture of the society uh, if you really would like to change the corporate culture. And between these extremes, I think somewhere uh, it's only the corporate culture, it's only the private culture. No, it's There's, both. It's, it's definitely both. both. It's definitely both. Um, and it's also good that what happens around companies influences what happens inside com companies. Otherwise, we would never move towards sustainability or social responsibility. Mm -hmm. I think that's really, really important. But if you look at our founder, at um, Robert Bosch, uh, he already was very intrinsic in, in that social responsibility at a time where other people didn't even think about treating the workers in a, in a decent and, and human way. So there are people who have that from their values mm -hmm. and um, they also shape then companies from the inside. But of course, it's a reaction from both sides and we have to react on what's going on around us. So would you consider, uh, after our discussion so far, would you consider resilience as well as a, as a value? It definitely, now I think it's a capability. Mm -hmm. It's a capability that helps you to follow your values and, and to, to shape the environment you're in. But of course, from my point of view, also a company can be resilient, resilient. or not yeah, resilient. Social resilience, yeah. psychological resilience. Yeah. Actually, the term comes from materials, uh, you know, yeah. resilient materials. Yeah. Um, so, last question then. Um, uh, actually, I could talk for hours, but I know that we have a limited time, so that's why it's the last question. Um, we talk about values, we talk about leadership mm -hmm. that, in the way we, that is framed by authentic leadership. And, one of, and I already mentioned the vulnerability talk. Mm -hmm. um, in authentic leadership, uh, vulnerability is, um, is, is, is at the core of many things. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to show your vulnerability to really become creative and, and it's... Um, almost one of the fundamental mm -hmm. uh, elements. At the same time, when you look up the term resilience mm -hmm. uh, and you look up the opposite, it's simply vulnerability. So how does that work together? You have to be resilient and you have to be vulnerable. How does that fit for you? Um, what, what I don't like about phrases is this, you have to. Um, 
I think some things are a decision and um, I had a very, very good coach once for, for the team in Postal in BMW. Um, I'm doing a little bit of advertising now, Dr. Hartwig, really nice guy. <laughs> and uh, he told us in a very, very stressful and um, situation full of conflicts in the team, he told us inside everybody has exactly the same degree of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. The question is only how many layers of protection people put around it. And his message was not, you have to take those uh, protection layers away from people because some people are then really feeling so naked that they start behaving not a positive way, but a negative way. So for me, the vulnerabil vulnerability is there, definitely. Mm -hmm. The question, how much of that you present openly to people. Let's have a short cat break. <laughs> cat. <laughs> okay, see? She At least one person <laughs> obeys. <this>. obeys. <laughs> um, so vulnerability is, is not neglectable. It's there. Mm -hmm. And um, vulnerability only means if you, if you open up that you get a deeper connection to people. At the same time you said it's, everybody has the same, mm -hmm. uh, or you believe that everybody has the same uh, level of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of how many protecting layers, yeah. onion layers you, you put on that. But these protective layers aren't that exactly the resilience layers? Um, parts of them, yes. But vulnerability, if, you, if you're soft inside, it doesn't mean that if somebody touches you there, mm -hmm. you're going to die. Mm -hmm. Resilience for me is you can actually open, but you have mechanisms not to crawl and die because somebody starts to touch you there on this very soft point. And that's, um, I never looked it up. And for me, it's strange that resilience and vulnerability are, are actually the contrast because for me, they're connected. Okay. Um, I think we come to a natural end now because the cat seems obviously to <laughs> ask for attention. Also, I know we are running out of time slowly. So what I can say is uh, I didn't need to be resilient to have that conversation for you. It was a, a, really a pleasure. Thank to you. To me Sylvia. too. Thank you, Micha. Thank you, Kat, for your contributions. <laughs>